Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good. Good awesome. That is a little bit kind of down. How's everybody today? Great. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And if you look outside, you know it's it's a your atypical fall day, so there's a little bit of a chill in the air and everything, but it's beautiful. You know, it's a wonderful time. And it gives us that that awakening of that fall spirit. And I, I love that. That means that Thanksgiving is just right around the corner. And so time for food, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't need any, but then again, you know, I can't help myself. So speaking of food, yesterday we had our first men's breakfast and it was awesome. Uh, kind of blew us all completely out. We were, when Terry and I were talking about this, we've been kind of planning on doing some things. We were thinking, oh, you know, maybe six, seven people there and we'll get off to a start. And, and we had 14, so God had different plans for us, which was awesome. We just made some adjustments on the fly. So next month, instead of having it at Tommy's, because we really couldn't hear all that well in there. That was really good food and everything. Um, so we're gonna hold it here, and then we're gonna bring the food in, and then hopefully we can uh, kind of build from there. But it was a great, great time. We were off to a very good start there. So thank you for all that attended that. And if you have others who would like to attend, uh, feel free to invite them to come on along. Um, you know, we'll have to figure out what we're going to do for Terry for next month. Uh, he had what I would term a swimming uh, cinnamon roll yesterday. So. <laughs> it was about this big around, and it was literally swimming in icing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking over there going, okay, my, my A1C would jump about 200 points. Uh, but he's you know, ladling the, uh, <laughs> the sugar over the top, and I'm sitting there going, oh, you're going to pay for that later. <laughs> nope. But it was a really good time. Yeah, I, uh, <coughs> he went over to Pizza <coughs> Ranch and went and had lunch on top of it. So uh, <laughs> some of us can do that better than others. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, November 12th, we have our final race of the season, Orange Track Racing. Of course, that follows NASCAR. So we start in February, go through November. And we're going to have finals, which means it goes a long time. So when you have, when you're the winner of your class, we put you into uh, a case and we hold that car so you don't race it for the rest of the year. Once you win, it goes into the case. And then when we have our finals, then all of those winning cars come out and we do all the eliminations out of those. So it's a really fun time. People really get into it too. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of fun. Um, so if you want to know more about that, orangetrackracing.org. And that gives you everything. We got videos up so you can see it. But you know, it's for it's truly made for kids. Um, so kids from three years old to eighty-seven. Uh, so just come on out and have a good time. So November nineteenth, gonna have Christmas with a capital C, and it's a really fun movie. Um, and uh, so we're gonna have. Uh, our usual refreshments in here. So we've got popcorn, we'll have popcorn and brownie bites and and we will have hot dogs in the steamer, cheese dogs in the steamer. And uh, then we will also, I, I heard the rumor that there's possibility of having some Christmas cookies and those kind of things float around as well. So, uh, but it'll be a good time and, and uh, really looking forward to the, to the movie. So, um, check that out. You can see that at Grace Street Cinema on our website in there and get all the details there. Basically, the doors open at 5.30, movie starts at 6. So just have a good time and uh, have, a, have, a, have a fun, fun evening. Uh, Advent then starts on November 27th. It just seems like this is going so fast anymore. This year has just flown by for me. Uh, but we're doing a study called the Advent Conspiracy. And so um, it kind of gives us that opportunity to step back a little bit. Hi, Matthew. Uh, to step back a little bit from the norm and the buzz and everything that we're used to, all the commercialization, and look at Christmas from a whole different perspective. And uh, basically our tenant points that are up on screen are, is to worship fully, um, to make sure we know the reason for the season and to act it out and to live it out, spend less, give more, and love all, because that's truly what Christmas is all about. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. We are going to 
uh, you know, take a look at things that truly matter through the season and kind of give ourselves an awakening of what really matters in celebrating the season, what it's all about. Um, then following that on December 10th, I told you we had a lot of stuff going on. So December 10th, fun time. Who in here can sing? Okay. Who makes it really well? Who in here can make a joyful noise to the Lord? Awesome. Well, I'm glad you put all your hands up because we're going to have Christmas caroling and we're going to go around to a couple of the care centers and, and uh, we've been doing that for the last few years and it really lights the people up when we go in there. So whether we can carry a joyful tune or not doesn't make a difference. The people join in singing with us in there and it's a really good time and it really, really bolsters their day. They, they really look forward to it. Following that then, we're going to come back here and we're going to have chili and cornbread and all the good fixings that go along with that. And I heard that, that there might be some Christmas cookies and, and some uh, candy cane, what's that called? The, uh, candy cane peppermint hot chocolate. So uh, we happen to have that back over there anytime you want it. Uh, it's not habit forming at all from what I've heard. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, Christmas Eve, we're going to have a candlelight service at 11 o'clock p.m. here. And uh, because we're having that service at 11, then we want you guys to be able to spend Christmas Day with your family. And so there won't be a service on Sunday morning. We're going to do it on Saturday night instead at the 11 o'clock service. So did everybody get that? You got it all locked into your memory? Yes, ma'am. Is there any secret about the Christmas Eve candlelight service? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is. Cool. Yes. <laughs> and cookies? And cookies. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Do you Absolutely. have a request list? We, we take requests. So. Chocolate chip. Well, I was talking about the music, but okay, chocolate chip. <laughs> we'll do chocolate chip cookies. We'll do all of it. Yes. <laughs> I used to be in radio, so we took requests all the time, you know. So. But if you have requests that you'd like to hear, then especially for the Christmas caroling, uh, Wednesday night we, we got together and we were talking about it, and so we're going to kind of practice ourselves up just a little bit, raise our standards up for when we get to the care center. So we're going to practice uh, uh, songs, so we've got a few picked out already, but if you have a request, we take requests. Jingle bells. Absolutely. All right, you yeah. get to leave it. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> oh, 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 that changed it right there. Uh, no, we, we, we can uh, accommodate those things. So. We do jingle bells. Our, <laughs> yeah. Our call to worship this morning that Pastor Cherry has chosen, it comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31, from the New Living Translation. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And as I was sitting here today and we were commiserating this morning early on uh, when, when we got here and we were setting up, so I had to slather on uh, lidocaine on my back because I was lifting heavy stuff yesterday and I just twisted wrong. So I get all this pain, you know, and you just kind of feel drugged down. And then you look at a verse like this. Um, no matter what you're going through in life, no matter how what it's thrown at you, if we trust in the Lord, He gives us new strength. We'll find that strength to get through. We'll find that ability to get through that situation. God doesn't keep us from the situations, but He brings us through the situations. But then the next part of that verse, it says, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. And if you ever go out onto a lake early in the morning, um, or just even down, if you want to go down to the Cedar River down here by the bridges on 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street, there's a whole family of eagles. That's where my office used to be before the flood. Uh, and so I get down there very early in the morning. I get down there around 6, 6.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I just sit out there and I fix a cup of coffee for the office and I'd sit out there and I'd look at it, and these eagles were out there fishing in the water. And if you've never seen that, and they just soar around, they're soaring around, they're surveying the water, looking for their meal. And if you just look at it, it's, it 
just looks effortless. They're just out there floating. And it's a great, that wonderful family, sight. That family of eagles has grown. Yes, mm, yes. Big time. So when we think we're all just beat down, we're, we need to have that perseverance in the face of exhaustion. You know, you get to the point where you just don't think you can make another move. You come home from work after a long daily uh, dealing with the stuff, and you just want to kick back and relax. So we turn on the telly, and whoa, what happens? Especially now. Mm -hmm. Well, you get this never-ending stream of vitriol attack ads. Mm -hmm. You know, one person attacking the other. And, and I wouldn't say that there's any right or wrong in it. It's just that... You're getting all this noise, and it's vitriol. It's 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 tearing one person down to make the other person look good. Mm -hmm. and that never works. That's never a solution to a problem. So, who here is not absolutely exhausted from that constant barrage of political ads? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, now we're it's getting replaced with all of the Medicare open enrollment stuff. Yeah. <laughs> People of my age can you know have to deal with, but yeah. and the Christmas ads are already okay. Christmas, oh, yeah. I was gonna say, and right around the corner is the Christmas ads. Yeah. So, you know, when we when we give up on that, how do we survive all this? You know, how do we not just give up and walk away? Well, we're called in this call to worship to trust in the Lord. He'll give us the strength to get through it. He'll pull us through all those things. So if we turn away from the noise of the day. And we go to the quietness of God, that still small voice that will talk to us. We turn to God. See, and in doing that, it's called discipleship. We turn to God. We want to hear from God. We want to learn from God. We want to take that experience and draw it into ourselves. And that's what's called enabling power. So he will give us that strength. We will run and not grow weary. And we will walk and not faint. So we don't give up. We, we take on discipleship. We take on that power of God. God's strength, <clears throat> strength in our time of weakness. Those who trust in God with expectancy find power to accomplish his purposes within our life. And we kind of talked about that in the sermon last week. Of looking for God to bring us through those things and to give us that power to bring us through. Paul, so he had that kind of faith. He boasted in his own weakness. He boasted about how he was the worst sinner of all. He had a weakness in his spirit. He had a weakness about himself. But he boasted in that because then he could show God's power working through him and the awesome things that he would do with Paul's life. And Paul had that kind of faith. See, Paul acknowledged that weakness is the first step in receiving God's enabling power. We have to first say, yes, Lord, I am weak. I can't do it all. I am not in control. And once we sur surrender that over to God, then that's called trusting in him. Trusting in him. The old English word for that is fear. It's to trust in God. Those who fear the Lord will find new strength. That's one of the other... And it's not being afraid of God, but it's trusting in God to get you through. So in our sense of weakness and need, God has the opportunity then to strengthen us. When we receive God's strength, we soar like eagles. We run like champions to finish the mission that God has planned for our lives. And when we give God the glory for all of that he accomplishes through us, we receive then salvation and renewal through that. When we turn it over to God and we give God the glory, then he pours those blessings upon us. That's salvation. That's renewal. When God renews his people, they soar like eagles, <clears throat> which means they're able to go out and spread their wings. They're able to go out and spread the message. They're empowered by God to do the work and the will that God has planned for them in their lives. God gives the saved renewed strength. He keeps them from growing weary and prevents their fainting. Endurance is part of salvation. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the opportunity to bring your message forth that you have given to Pastor Terry this morning. We ask a special blessing on him this morning as he
gives us that message as he talks about this on never wanting to give up. Lord, of persevering through the situation, trusting in you, and receiving that blessing that you have for us. Lord, open our ears to hear. Open our minds and our hearts to receive that message today and to live it out each and every day. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. I just realized the sun was coming out. It's looking <laughs> nice out there. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone that's here this morning and those of you that are joining us online. This morning's the final message in the Predecide series that we're doing, and it's called When You Want to Give Up. Now, this is a sad statement on, so there's some older folks, you know, your parents and older that kind of uh, looking at the younger crowd and they're going, they're starting to maybe give up on them a little bit, like they just don't get it, they don't Last night, we went down to Coral Ridge because Diane needed some new shoes. And we ended up going to an actual shoe store instead of going to like, you know, the, the Walmart or you know, Target of, of the shoe stores. We actually went to an actual shoe store. And the young man that was assisting us, I could have sworn this kid was like mid to late twenties. And we were having this conversation and I talked about how it was in ministry and we were talking and he said something. And I went, wait a second. And he, I said, you know, what really gets at me is that two people on opposite ends of the spectrum cannot sit down at the table and have a conversation, get up, shake hands, and walk away friends. He goes, I'm really glad you said that. I'm really glad you said that. There's, there's hope for our kids, so we can't give up on them. We, we don't want to give up on them. But then, then the most powerful piece came He's 19. And he talked about what happens if he has a bad day and he goes home and he's still living with his mom and dad, but you know, that's, that's to be expected at that age, right? But he walks in and he'll have a conversation with his mom telling her about the day and then she basically says, don't give up. Don't give up. So I was very encouraged last night. So now I'm encouraged that you probably can hear me better. Um, but in your life, as you're doing things, have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever felt like giving up? Now, to the young ones here, I was in choir as a kid. And at sophomore or freshman year, I, I was just singing as part of the choir, but my choir director decided to sign me up for state competition. My level of security and talking in front of people, let alone singing from them, was like way down there. <laughs> and I bet I literally stood up in front of the judges and I froze. And I walked off. I didn't give up. See, by senior year, I was singing leads in swing choir, which was what they call what now? Show, Show choir. choir. Mm -hmm. Chicago, of all things. <laughs> Fall, high voice. Spring, low voice. Made it really hard to sing some of those Chicago songs. But, <laughs> but I didn't give up. And, and that's, you know, when we think about things that we, where we like to give up, that falls into sports, or it might fall into school, heaven forbid, a relationship, or our goals, or even our dreams. See, I had a, a vision as a 14 year old that I would be a pastor at some point and I walked away from that at 18 when I went to college because I was going to go into international law international management I was going to be a diplomat I was going to be a politician thank you for saving me from that but here's the thing I started and then I stopped but then God, God's not finished. When he has a plan for your life, he pulls you right back into it and he walks you through that. And so ultimately, here I am speaking in front of y'all. Even as a teen, I got past that whole thing of freezing in front of the judges. I did a thing called Model United Nations. Model United Nations, we took on the role of a country 
and then we went to this whole thing at UNI that was like we were actually in the UN. And I got up my senior year, we were representing India, which was the unofficial third world leaders of the world, right? And denounced our relationship to Mother Russia. <laughs> in front of 2,500 kids. That's a long way from not being able to sing in front of three judges. Don't ever give up. God's got a plan for you. And see, there's things that get in the way though. There's there's resistance where you got frustration and you get these bumps in the rolls, you might, or bumps in the road, you might have a change in your life that throws you completely off. But for me, in almost every single situation where I wanted to give up, I was able to adjust course and get through it. The only times I have really found it difficult, sometimes impossible, was relationships. Because it was more than just me involved. So there was two people, and quite honestly, if the other person in a relationship doesn't want that relationship to go anywhere, it just is not. So that's, that's, that can be kind of difficult. But I never gave up until it was obvious that God had <coughs> shown me something different. So when my first wife didn't, there's a whole story there, but God had something else for me. And when it comes to marriage, Diane and I have now been married this year. I'll see, we got married in 2000, so I can remember how many years. So this year will be 22, <laughs> together for 24. It's been, a, it's been something where we've never given up and we've, made a commitment to one another that we never will give up. Now, maybe you've been praying and praying for a change in your circumstance. Maybe you're praying for a family member. Maybe you're praying for a friend or a coworker. Maybe you're praying for that healing or for restoration or for them to come into that relationship with Jesus. And if you, those of you that have been with us on, on Wednesday nights, our prayer sheet, we've got this list. I mean, it's a good sized list of people that we are praying for softened hearts and to have the revelation and come into a relationship with Christ. And that might take a few months. It might take 40 years, but we're going to continue to pray for these people because we're called to. But as we are doing that, whatever it is, when we come across that frustration, when we come across that depression, the fear, the anger, that whole range of emotions that can kick in when you're trying to do something. At some point, the fight in you personally, in your worldly body, may just run out and you want to give up. That's what today's message is about. When you want to give up. Father, we are so thankful for your goodness, your presence, your word, and your people. Father, we pray that you would meet all of us today, and that as your people, we would meet you through worship and be transformed by your living and active word, that we could finish what you have called us to start, that you would give us the courage, God, to not give up. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So today, as we finish this series, I want to just kind of recap a little bit, because it's been six weeks, it's been six weeks since we started this series, asking the question, if your life is moving in the direction of your decisions, do you like the direction your decisions are taking you? And with God's help, we've gone through this series to help you determine the course of action before you make a decision in the moment. The first week we uh, talked about how you can take back your life this way. The following week, uh, it was the keys to overcoming temptation, how the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our life. And then we followed that up with the power of consistency. And consistency is that key to our spiritual strength, success, physical health, and other things. And then with God's help, we can be consistent and achieve every goal that God's placed on our hearts. Then we got to getting closer to God, where we found out that if we want to live with full devotion to Jesus, 
it's never going to happen accidentally. Things just don't happen accidentally. We have to predecide to live with an ongoing single pursuit of God. And the next week we determined that if you want to be generous when you have more, you have to learn to be generous when you have less. But this can only happen when you decide to stop holding back. And then last week, uh, Pastor Mark got us through following Jesus was never meant to be safe. We have to be faith-filled risk-takers to live out God's calling on our lives. In one word, that will change your life, which was faith. And this ministry is, for Mark and I, is a step out in faith. And we're seeing fruit. Throughout this series, we've been telling you, you have to pre-decide before the moment of decision comes. Otherwise, you're going to make a decision rashly. And so we finish up today with when you want to give up you need to tell yourself what? I am a finisher. It's such a perfect way to finish the series, pardon the, the, the kind of word to finish, but it is. It's, it's, and it's help us to avoid all the frustration, that depression, that anger, that fear that we get when we don't. Now, I made a decision to, I pre decided that I'm not going to let some of the things that happen in life bother me. When we left the men's breakfast yesterday, there's a railing that sticks out into the parking area from the business next door. And as I backed out, I heard a, this loud scream. I got out and I looked at him like, hmm. yeah, didn't break the tail light. No dent, just a little paint scrape. It's all good. And I told the guys, you know, this was 30 years ago. We don't want to talk about that out there. <laughs> but I had pre-decided that with any frustration or any problems that I was going to get out in front of it and pre-decide that, and this graphic is perfect for it, that I am ready, I am consistent, I am devoted, I am generous, I am faithful, and I am a finisher. And this is kind of the whole series wrapped up into one quick graphic. Now, starting something can be very easy. I uh, was talking with Atlas yesterday and, and uh, him this morning. They're starting a business. Starting is easy. <laughs> Having that idea is easy, but taking it to fruition. So we'll be praying for you for that as you move forward with that. So what do you think separates average people from amazing people. Well, what do you think separates those who are really fulfilled in life from those who are often empty? What do you think is the difference between those who struggle and those who succeed? <clears throat> Let's start with the things that it is not. It's not their intelligence. It's not their appearance. It's not their talent. It's not their education. It's not who or what they know. The difference is their perseverance. Now, in another lifetime, I managed restaurants, fast food restaurants. And I went to one from one franchisee to another at a specific restaurant. And when I went to them, they had me take this test. Before they even hired me, they made me take this test. And through this test, they said, you're not a leader. You'll never be able to lead people. That made my blood boil. Mm -hmm. And I set out to prove them wrong. They went ahead and hired me as an assistant anyway. And when I left that franchise to go into the tech world, I had taken two restaurants from running in the red to running in the black. I proved them wrong. It had nothing to do with how smart I was, how, what I looked like, my talent, my education. I persevered. I was not going to let somebody else through some silly test tell me that I couldn't do something. 
they, so perseverance is about a willingness to stick to it, to refuse to quit. Now, there's a, an author, her name is Angela Duckworth, and she has done some groundbreaking research on this. She studied why really successful people succeed. She looked at business leaders, she looked at military leaders, she looked at teachers in very difficult situations. She also looked at fifth graders who could spell the hardest words in the entire world, and she asked, what are the qualities that separate these successful people from other successful people? And the number one quality that she identified is what she called grit. She defines grit as the strength of character that refuses to quit. The difference is one's willingness to stay in the fight. It's the strength of character that refuses to quit. And I like her quote where she says, enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. It's easy to start, but it's rare to finish. So that's why we're pre-deciding that we are finishers, because by nature we tend to take the easy way out, the path of least resistance. By nature we tend to do that. It's just, it's just how, as a fallen society, we are dialed in. As disciples of Jesus, though, how do we strengthen our perseverance when the devil wants us to quit? How do we strengthen our character, our refusal to quit? Now let's look at 2 Timothy, where Paul is writing from a very deep underground dungeon in a Roman prison. Now, to give you a little bit more of a picture to this, imagine that the basement or the bottom of this prison is basically a sewer. So you can take all the movies and TV shows that you've watched if you've never been in a sewer and you can just imagine what that looks like, right? So he's down there. He knows that the end of his life is coming to an end. Roman Emperor Nero has already sentenced him to be beheaded. But he refused to give up. He was going to finish his race. And so in his letter, Paul commissions Timothy to carry on that work. That's the next step in finishing his race. He passes it along. Mark, I know, has been in business a long time. He knows this. You, and many of you know this. When you have a position, you prepare your successor to take over your place. Because you're going on to bigger and better things. Either that or it's time to retire. One of the two. But you prepare, and that's what he is doing. And this letter is a very emotional farewell to his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy. But even in this farewell, he is encouraging Timothy to continue, to not give up. He tells Timothy uh, these four things. He says, be strong in grace and faithfulness. He tells him to endure suffering and not to be afraid of it. He tells him that he will suffer with Christ just as Paul has. And he also tells Timothy that he will face opposition and hard times. So let's look at a piece of this from 2 Timothy 4, 5. Paul writes, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. So here he's telling him he needs to re-decide what he's going to do. And then he says, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. He's telling Timothy to finish what he started. And then Paul finishes in uh, 6 and 8. He says this, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Paul has finished his race. But just like Timothy, when Paul was writing to him, we have not finished ours. God has more for each of us to do. It's almost like saying, you're not dead. You're not done. Get back at it. 
God has more plans for you. He has more assignments for us. It's, well, Diane and Lori already know this happens during sermons. So I love when Diane comes home and she tells me stories of her day. And she had a mom and daughter come in the other day and they were, I'm going to pay. No, I'm going to pay. No, I'm going to pay. And God gives her the, it, she doesn't, he doesn't give it to her the words right away, but he finally goes, don't take her blessing from her. And he's talking to the mom. She's talking to the mom about the daughter wanting to pay. And I remember she said it was the mom or the daughter who said, we ha the mom said, we have a sister here. And I instantly, in my mind, I know she's talking about a sister in Christ. And then she thanked her and blessed her. Those, I, I, I get so much joy out of hearing these stories. It, it's, it's our assignment and how we treat other people in our lives. We have more ministry to do. We have more love to give. We have more people to help. We have more hope to share. Now, if you're sitting next to someone, turn toward them. If you're not, crane your head around. Look at them and say, God has more for you. God has more for you. God has more for you. Now say, if you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. We have to fully finish that work he has for us. And I can just hear some, bless you, bless you. I can just hear some people going, but pastor, I'm so tired. I'm so busy. I have so many things to do. I want to, I want to, but I just, I, I can't. I just have so much to do. And I know you can all relate to this, but listen to this. In his book, Getting Things Done, David Allen says this, much of the stress that people feel doesn't come from having too much to do. It comes from not finishing what they've started. And for those who are part of Prograstinators Anonymous, we know how that goes. It's not the things I need to do, it's things I need to finish before I move on. And, and I know I've, I've said this probably in too much, but I, I Still in the back of my mind, I hear Pastor Mark on, on the old KOKZ, or not KOKZ, uh, KWOF, KWOF. I hear him saying, a good Christian is not necessarily a busy Christian. I keep hearing that over and over again. It reminds me there's things to get done. But I want to take this, this uh, quote a little bit further. Let's change this up. And let's say, much of the stress that people feel doesn't come from having too much to do. It is because they have not done what God has called them to do. How many of us are too busy doing the things of the world and not doing what God has called us to do? And this right here can lead us to a very simple prayer. And that is, God, speak to me and tell me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to do. Oh, by the way, that, mean, that means we have to open our eyes and open our hearts to hearing and seeing what God has for us and what he wants to show us. So take some time and think back at the things that God has already told and shown you that you need to do. And are you still working in them? Have you finished those? The answer is going to be right in front of you. All you got to do is do it. Steal it from Nike, just do it. Okay? <laughs> this is what the, Jesus said to the church in Sardis in Revelation. So let's jump to Revelation 3. And this is the second part of the first verse. It says, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. That's a little cryptic, right? So let's break that down. Other churches saw the church at Sardis. As this dynamic church that was doing all these things. What Jesus is calling out, though, is that their secularism showed their lack of a spiritual life. 
It reminds me of some of these big churches that put on this beautiful production. It's like going to a concert, hearing a message, and the offering comes around, you put some money in the plate for the performance, and you leave, and you don't change. You're not changed by the message you've heard. You're not changed by God. You're not hearing what God has for you. And it's because they looked good on the outside, but not on the inside. Jesus talks about, when he's talking to the, the religious leaders, he's talking about how they keep the outside of the pot clean, but they don't clean the inside. How often do we feel like that? That because of our sin, we feel dead inside. We put on a good face on the outside, but inside we're dying. I just see people walking around with you know these sticks with a happy face. But Jesus continues in verses 2 and 3 and says, Wake up! Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and return to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly, as unexpected as a thief, and that goes right back to what Jesus said when he was in his ministry. That the thief will come unexpectedly. We need to be prepared for when he comes back. We need to heed this call from Jesus to wake up. He's telling us that we have unfinished business and that we need to finish it. This is where we can continue the prayer that we just had. So let's expand on this. God, speak to me and tell me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to do. Then add this, show me my unfinished business, my unfinished assignment. The things that God is prompting us to do may number in many different things depending on who you are and what he's called you to do. And you may have had every intention to reach out to someone to heal a broken relationship that you have. Maybe God has prompted you to share your faith with someone else through your testimony. Maybe you were to give to this or, or give to that. Maybe you were supposed to get involved in a ministry at church. We all have those unfinished assignments, that unfinished business that God has called us to and that we have not finished. What is it for you? Only you can answer that question. That's between you and God. But what is it? In the following passage, Paul reminds the Corinthians of the promise that they made. So this is about unfinished business and, and what they had done. The Corinthian church was going to give in a big way. So if we drop back to 1 Corinthians, they promised to give all this money to the church in Jerusalem. But as time passed, they didn't follow through. So this is Paul's advice to them. It comes from 2 Corinthians 8, 10, and 13. It says, here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now, you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give it according to what you have, not what you don't have. Now, of course, I don't mean your giving should make your life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. And God used Paul to prompt them to finish what they started. Now, here's a rhetorical question for you. Who here has just wanted to asked it at the beginning, I'm going to ask it again. Besides, what's the big deal if we quit? Well, let me tell you. It's because every decision you make is one that determines your future. It determines the kind of person that you are right now and that you will be in the future. So if you're not making good decisions now, if you're not making better decisions now, you're not going to have a good life or a better life later. That every decision you make is like a domino effect. 
when I was three, my dad took a position with a different company that had bought out a portion of the company he worked for, and he moved us two hours away. My life is very different now because he made that decision. But because of the way my life is right now, I'm thankful for that decision. Every decision we make affects our future. So if you decide to quit, you are deciding that you are not a finisher. If you decide to stand strong in the Lord, though, you will persevere and you are deciding that you are a finisher. In high school, I go back to high school because I got a lot of examples. I was, I was a runner. I was in track. Now, I did a lot of things in high school. I worked uh, at a grocery store. I worked at a, all at the same time, mind you. Grocery store clothing store, summers was scout camp, during school year it was, besides school, choir, and that included three different types of choir, band, four different kinds of band, drama, basketball, and the track. Now to be fair, basketball was simply a time for me to get ready for track. Because I, I have a condition where there's no, hardly any cartilage in my elbows, so I could shoot well for about three shots, and then they went everywhere. So I just used it to get ready. I was a hurdler. And I was actually pretty decent at it. I had the school record. I broke it after 25 years. Now, this isn't about me, so no piping here. The, the, the thing is, is the one night I was mopping at the grocery store, and I went numb head to toe. I could not move. X-rays the next morning showed my lower spine right here doing this. Looks like a, what we would do if we were drawing a lightning bolt. And I was told that morning that by the time I was 25, I'd be rolling around in a wheelchair. Now, I made a decision not to quit. I made a decision to persevere. That was 31 years ago, so I should be in the wheelchair <laughs> twice, you know, quite a ways over, right? I made a decision, and I kept running, and I kept, in fact, I probably started living life a little, at a little higher speed, because I wanted to get things done before I was 25, and now I look back at it as a story of not quitting. I committed. It's about persevering through things. God had other plans. Now, remember what I said earlier, when we commit, we do not quit. So in Acts 20, as Paul's telling the Ephesian elders that the Holy Spirit has told him that in city after city, the jail and suffering lie ahead. That comes from Acts 20, 23. In this next verse, he says this, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Now, I could still do that in a wheelchair. But God has other things that he wants me to do that I need to be upright for. So I continue to do them. Here, Paul had predecided that no matter what, he was going to stand strong in the Lord and persevere and finish. Because he was not doing it for himself. It is how we can look at what God has called us to do. Think about the things that you can put in the following blanks. But my blank is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. Is that comfort? Is that your net worth? Is that your others' opinions of you? Is it your hopes and dreams, your popularity, your money, your 401k, or any number of things? But my blank is worth nothing to me. My life, nothing, you know, this all encompasses, just like Paul did. Everything in my life is nothing. It's about finishing. And here's the thing. When we're going to finish, we have to do it like this. We take a step. And then we keep taking those steps until we get to where God has us finished at. And then we do the next thing that he has for us. Each step of the way, you can remind yourself of what God is doing. 
not what you're doing, but what God is doing. Jesus is a perfect example. From the beginning to the end of his ministry, he did it all for the Father, all the way to the cross. In the garden, he prayed, and this comes from Mark 14, 36. He said, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, but please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Even Jesus knew his work was not finished and he would persevere all the way to the end. It was not until Jesus says, Tetaleste, which is Greek for it is finished, that he was finished, what God had started out for him to do. Jesus was telling God, I finished the assignment you sent me to complete. And Jesus endured the same things we do. The mocking, the bickering, the fighting, watching people desecrate the temple. We see that <laughs> happening in churches today. People blaspheme the, the Father. There's pain, there's suffering. He endured it all to the very end, and he never quit. And even after enduring a beating that likely would have killed me, and it would have killed me, I couldn't have endured that. I have visuals in my mind of what that looked like. Jesus continued from where he was beaten to where he would be crucified. He took one step at a time and he kept going until it was finished. And then after everything that his people had done to him, we get to what he says in Luke 23 through 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Talk about refusing to give up and being committed to what God called us to do, what God had called him to do from the very beginning. Jesus had pre predecided that he was ready, that he was consistent, that he was devoted, that he was generous, that he was faithful, and that he was a finisher. So when you think you cannot go any further, God will help you. Derek Hammond is a wonderful example of this. Uh, some of you aren't old enough to remember this because this goes all the way back to the 1982 Barcelona Olympics. I was like a sophomore, junior in high school at this point. He was one of the favorites in the 400 meters. And he took off like a shot. About halfway through the race, you see him pull up and fall to the track. He had ruptured his hamstring. And the next thing you see is the camera pans over. This guy is fighting through security and all these people to get down to the track from the stands. It's his father. His father gets down to the track and he puts his arm, puts Derek's arm around him and he helps him hobble to the finish. There was no quitting. I can't watch that clip without getting emotional. We don't run the race alone. This is a perfect example of the father running the race with us. When we get to that point, yeah, think about footprints, the footprints poem, which is this, what God will carry. He will get us through this. But the problem is, is quitting in our culture is an option. Think about marriage. It's no longer a covenant. It's just a contract where you can get out of it. You can quit. There's that whole death to you part thing that's in there. Yeah, that. <laughs> it's not being lived out. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. We're not living it out. But what if when God calls us with a vision, with a dream, and, and we said, this is from God, let's get to it. It's a, there's a covenant there. And it's really like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Instead of straight up quitting on God, we need to go to him. And we need to give him those doubts, those fears, and that disappointment. And here's the thing. It's okay to go to God and say, I don't get it. I don't understand. I'm confused. 
But Lord, I'm listening. Tell me. Help me through this. Help me to the finish line. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to live the, our lives the way that he did. And Jesus was a finisher. And too often today, Christians are viewed as we don't finish and we don't live the life that God has called us to live. And that turns people off. And we need to change that. We need to start living that life and finishing that way. Father God, today I pray that the Holy Spirit would do a deep work in our church. God, open our ears to hear what it is that you want us to do. What is our assignment, Father? What is the vision you have for our lives? What unfinished business do we have? Remind us, Father. Show us by the power of your word what these things are. Help us to be faithful, to run the race to its completion. Heavenly Father, get us ready. Help us to be consistent, devoted, generous, and faithful. Father, let us be finishers. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. time of communion today I'd like you to think back on the scriptures I'd like to think back on the mission that God put on Jesus heart and he put a mission on his heart to save all the people to bring them back into a right relationship with God and if we look at it and one of the examples we had in yesterday in the devotional that I had was that Jesus went back into his hometown after he had started his ministry and the people rejected him. The very people he was there to save rejected him. But it didn't stop him. He persevered through. A lot of us tend to, to look at that roadblock and we just stop. We just go on. What's the use? But he persevered. And he brought salvation to all He endured the cross. The Romans, out of this crucifixion that they had invented, this torturous way to kill a person, there was a word that was invented especially for that. It's called excruciating. And it described the whole ordeal that that person would go through. It was excruciating. They had to fight for each breath. See, Jesus knew what his purpose was. He knew the the suffering, he knew the rejection, and he persevered through it all for us. And he took it all with him to the cross. And he persevered through it. He finished the job that God had given him to do. And it cost him his life in the process to give us everlasting life through him. So as we take our communion today, I want you to think back about that. I want you to think back that he knew as they were giving the, as they were, had the meal and he was giving them communion, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. It represented the sins of the world. And yet the person who was sitting next to him took that same communion with him and he took and ate the bread. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and after he had blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he gave it to them to drink. The blood that would wash them clean from their sins. And the person next to him took a drink. After the meal was over, he said to the person next to him, Now go and do what you must do. And do it. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew what he would have to persevere through. And he did it anyway. And he gave his life for you and I. The body of Christ, which is broken for you. Take me. 
and the blood of Christ shed for you. Who is taking care of them now? Um, one of her older sisters who is going through her own loss. So those children mm -hmm. are having to grow up a little bit faster than they ought to be mm -hmm. right now. Oh my gosh, that is so sad. I'm sorry. And what is the sister's name too? Uh, Sasha. Sasha. So Kim is the one with cancer, right? going through a lot of things and mm -hmm. somebody I tried to take under my wing and give some support to and okay. unfortunately I wasn't there for him then so okay. we could That's use a, a prayer. Sorry to ask you your name because I don't know it. I'm, I'm not good with names. It's so. okay. Um, Kata. Kata. You want to spell that for me? K-A-I-D-A. All right, Kata. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Adam. Uh, for my son, Demetrius, uh, choices he's made in his life. God, just bring the Holy Spirit upon me so that I can pray for these people correctly in the way that you would like me to pray for them, Jesus. I need your help this morning. So, Father God, we come to you this morning in prayer, some with heavy hearts for loss of loved ones, some are living daily in severe pain, waiting for a breakthrough. For such troubles in this life, you give us hope through your word, the, spirit of the, the sword of the Spirit, your Bible to guide us through this life for those that will uh, read and obey your word. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, you say, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being re renewed day by day. For our light and monetary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we thank you, Jesus, and we pray, pray your word that we may be comforted in these times of great heartache and pain and suffering. We believe and trust in you for your comfort and healing in all the trials in this life. You hem us in before, behind, and within to guide us and keep us on the path you have designed for each one of us. You are a great God and worthy of praise. Father God, I come to you this morning with heavy hearts 
for Becky, um, who has a friend named Chris who lost his son this weekend, and uh, for Kim and Sasha who lost their mother. Lord God, I pray for these people. I pray you will comfort them, Lord Jesus. There seems to be so many deaths here in this last month. And I know that when, uh, when you come and you have a place prepared for us, you will take us home to be with you. So we should not be sad, we should rejoice in your word. And we just thank you and praise you. But we have eight children here, Lord Jesus, that need your help. And children are young, they don't understand all of this about death and what happens when we die. So Father God, bring Christian people in their path and uh, just uh, put loving arms around them and just help them to um, get through and understand that um, life with you is so much better than life with, with uh, people that do not understand your word. So God, I pray for all of this family, Kim and Sasha and the eight children. Lord Jesus, be with them. Just hold them in your arms, in your loving arms forever. And I pray for uh, Don's friend who had six months sobriety and, and relapsed. I pray for healing of his spirit and his mind, Jesus. Comfort him and help him know that you are there with him. Be with Don and help him to know how to, to, how to speak to this man and how to comfort him so that he will continue on the path of sobriety. Father God, I ask for Kata for the school novel that she is writing. She is so special, Lord God, and we just pray for her. We pray you will give her words of wisdom to write and that she will um, succeed in doing this novel that she has started. And Lord, I pray for um, Atlas's son, Demetrius. I pray for his um, guidance. I pray that you will come into their lives and just um, guide them each and every day. Let your will be done in their lives, Lord. And just um, let them know that you are near. Hold them in your arms, Lord Jesus, and comfort them through these trials. As long as as all our children, Lord Jesus, it takes time. Sometimes it takes more time than others, but bring them into an understanding of you. Help them to read your word so they know how to live their lives, Lord God. For you are so great, and it is so much better to live life with you than to not have you in our lives. So I pray that you will put Christian people in their paths so that they will follow you. So today I also want to pray for healing for Amanda who broke her foot Friday, for Don's back and his arms, for Steve's shoulder and other issues, for all those that need your healing touch, Lord God. We pray the blood of Jesus wash over them and heal them completely. You are the great and mighty God, and all power and honor belong to you. So we come boldly before you today and ask this in Jesus' name, that you heal all these people, Lord God. And you come into their lives. Let the Holy Spirit wash over them, Lord Jesus. And Father God, we also ask that you supersede the upcoming election. We ask that people, um, that you put people in place with Christian values, that they will be a people of prayer so that they will run or govern our country according to your will and not their own. We humbly and boldly come to you this morning to ask for that you will once again, put America under one nation under God. We know that all who are in power were given the authority by you, for it says in Romans 13, 1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority that which God has not established. So we praise you and we thank you today for all that you will do this week, and we honor you and trust in your name, Jesus. You are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, the Great I Am. Amen. Amen. Word of encouragement to each of you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you face ahead, whether you have already placed your hopes and faith
faith in Jesus, or whether you're still questioning that, whether you maybe not believe. God is not quitting on us. He will never quit on you. Father, as we prepare to end this portion of our service, Father, we thank you for the lessons that we have learned throughout this, this series. Father, we thank you that you guide and direct this ministry, that you have given us visions of what you want. Father, you said that we needed a men's breakfast, and we tried under our own power, Father, and it didn't work, but when we relied on you, you took our earthly expectations and just blew them out of the water. And we thank you for that. That, Father, is how we know that you are, are at work. We see it and we hear it. Father, let us continue to move forward as a church, as a people, with that passion. And Father, for those that don't know you, Father, we pray again for a softened heart that they would see true Christians for whom they really are and not what the world has turned them into being. Father, help us to take these lessons as we leave this place today, as we uh, end the, the service online, that, that the people would take this message and that they would take and go out into the world and live a life worthy of the example that Jesus gave. In Jesus' precious and mighty name.